Chelsea Cruise. Supercharged crossflow. Awesome. Yesterday, I picked up my new project. Huge holes. Spin the bearing and it was, you know, sort of wobbly. I don't really know what I'm doing. Over tightened by some idiot. That would be me. Now, at the weekend, I failed. I'm only getting about 12 psi of oil pressure. Really stiff. A potential problem leaking fuel tube up. Hello, and welcome to this video. I'm Marcus Hayes, and over the last couple of days, I've been round to my other garage for a few hours to crack on with the engine swap for Maud, my Mordor Mark II Escort. I'm gonna be carrying on with that over the next few days, and you'll be able to see that in this video. But in short, her old blacktop ZTEC engine has been removed, and her new ST170 engine is ready to install. Tomorrow, I'm actually gonna pick up my new project, which I'm probably not gonna show you in this video, but tonight, me and my beautiful girlfriend Kat are taking my dad's Mark III Escort to Chelsea Cruise. And tonight is the Halloween special, which is usually a good one. All right, so change of plan. Because my dad's Mark III isn't old enough to be exempt from the ultra low emission zone in London, we're taking Kat's plastic fiesta that she likes to call Roger. All right, so we've arrived at Chelsea Bridge. The car park is already emptying, but while I'm here, I'm at least gonna get a little montage of some of the cars that are still here. Supercharged crossflow, awesome. Hello, into a new day. In fact, it's two days since the last clip. And yesterday, I successfully picked up my new project, which I'll show you at some point in the near future. Massive thanks to David and Danny Coogan for helping me collect the new project. Today, I'm around the garage before work, and I'm gonna show you where I'm at in terms of the ST170 swap for Maud. As you can see, there's a huge hole where her blacktop ZTEC used to be. I've removed the engine and left the gearbox in place. With regards to the gearbox, the clutch release bearing that was fitted was, you know, not spinning true. You'd spin the bearing and it was, you know, sort of wobbly. So I've now fitted the one that came out when I tried to fit the heavy duty bearing, which ended up being too long because I actually forgot to buy a new bearing this time. The pivot pin though has stayed in this time. As you can see, my garage is an absolute mess yet again. I've actually got the new project in my dad's garage at the moment because I'm using my dad's Mark III as a daily. Anyway, as you can see, I've got Maud's radiator and her exhaust manifold on the floor here. And here is her old blacktop ZTEC. I've pretty much removed everything from this engine that I need to fit to the ST170 engine, apart from the alternator bracket kit, which I can do once the engine's in, and also the coil pack bracket that goes under there, and I'll obviously be reusing these HT leads. But yeah, here is the ST170 engine, pretty much ready to drop into Maud. I've got the retro Ford engine mounts on there. I've got the water rail here, and I've got the original breather box Although I think the grommet that came on the breather box that came on this engine is in better condition than this one, so I might end up using that one. But yeah, she's ready to drop in. I've actually fitted the brand new clutch that didn't seem to work last time when I tried to fit it to Maud, and I'm hoping that that was just all caused by the fact that the release bearing I was trying to use was too tall. Another thing that I've got fitted to this ST170 engine that was fitted to the blacktop is the sump. And those of you who have been watching my videos will know that I really do want to eventually get a genuine Ford alloy sump that's modified to fit the car. But now that I've added two extra bolts to the back here and the same at the front, the sump does seem to seal better. And someone I met at the Northfield car meet that you would have seen in the last video actually advised me of a sealer to use. And it's this CT1, which is some sort of building sealer. And yeah, he was adamant that you could fit the sump and then remove the bolts and it still wouldn't leak. So hopefully that sealer, as well as the extra bolts, will keep this sump leak free. But yeah, as I say, the engine is ready to drop into Maud. So I'm probably gonna come back around here tomorrow morning before work to chuck the lump in. But 
as I was around here today, I thought I'd bring you up to speed with where I'm at, and then tomorrow I can literally just turn the camera on and chuck the lump in. So a couple of days have passed and as you've just seen, I have now finally fitted the ST170 lump into Maud's Bay. Still quite a lot of work to do before I can actually fire this engine up. But I am planning to try and fire this engine up for the first time this Saturday and I'm actually going to be continuing this video then. I've just got the bike carbs leaning on there at the moment because I just wanted to see what they look like but I will be taking those back off. I came across a video on the Dan ST Engineering YouTube channel that shows a couple of checks you can do with your bike carbs before you try and fire the engine up. I will leave a link to the Dan ST Engineering YouTube channel in the description of this video for any you guys that are thinking of going down the bike car route with your builds and it's worth noting that dan st engineering are the ones that supplied this inlet manifold for these bike carbs which were very kindly supplied by johnny bamba and massive thanks to you johnny if you're watching i know you've been waiting ages to see these carbs actually bolted to an engine in Maud's Bay. Before I go for now, there is something I want to mention to do with my dad's Mark III. Quite a few of you guys mentioned that when I've done the rear wheel bearings on this car in the video before last, that the spring wasn't located properly on this driver's side, but I have now sorted that out. And as always, I really appreciate you guys pointing out my mistakes, because as I always say, I'm no expert and I don't really know what I'm doing. Anyway, I'm going to continue this video at the weekend, so I'll see you in a sec. Hello, right, so it's not the weekend, but I've been cracking on with a couple of bits here at home to do with Maud's engine swap, so I thought I'd show you what I've been up to. I may have found a potential problem with her bike carbs, but I'll go into that in a minute. I've just been doing a bit of soldering and I've added a coil pack connector to the wiring loom for the ECU. Those of you who've been watching my videos a while will remember that a while ago, I nicked the coil pack connector off of this loom just so that I could repair Maud and get her back on the road quickly when the coil pack connector broke on her Nodis loom. I'm gonna be using an ME100 ECU from my friends at Motorsport Electronics for Maud's new engine. And I have since bought some spare coil pack connectors from Motorsport Electronics, but out of pure laziness, I decided to cut this coil pack connector back off the Nodis loom, and I've just soldered it to the ME100 loom, and I've put some heat shrink around each one. I will wrap some electrical tape around it just to strengthen it a bit more, but yeah, now that loom is ready to install into Maud. And as I've mentioned loads of times before on the channel, for any of you guys that are in the market for any type of engine management, definitely get in touch with Motorsport Electronics. I'll leave a link to their website in the description of this video. They can supply ignition only ECUs like the ME100 that I'm gonna be fitting to Maud, as well as ECUs for fuel injection, like the ME221 that's fitted to Esther, my Mark I Escort. And they also do an ME442, which is a more complicated ECU with more inputs and outputs. So yeah, regardless of what car you're building, Motorsport Electronics can supply an ECU to suit. And because I'm no auto electrician, I always opt to use these plug and play looms. They're really well made and they just make the job a lot easier. Anyway, on to the bike carbs. I mentioned earlier in the video that on the Dan ST Engineering YouTube channel, there was a really useful video that shows you know, some checks you can do on your bike carbs as well as identifying a few things. A couple of things to note, there's a pipe coming down here, which some people apparently mistake for the fuel input, and that's actually just a breather. The fuel input on these bike carbs is always at the bottom where the fuel bowls are, and I'm gonna turn these over. So yeah, this is the actual fuel input for the carburetors. Now, another thing, that is mentioned on that Dan ST Engineering video and saying that I think I've got a problem with these is to do with the floats which are inside these float bowls. Now these float bowls are removed by undoing the three screws on each one. I've only got one screw in each one because I had them apart earlier and I knew I was gonna be taking them apart again now. So on that Dan ST Engineering YouTube video, he mentions that these floats should 
have a little bit of springiness to them. Now this one hasn't, neither does that one, but this one does. So that's how they should be. And basically three out of the four of mine don't have that springiness. Now apparently that means there's something wrong with the float valves, which are situated under the float here. I have ordered a fresh set of those valves from Dan ST Engineering, but they might not actually arrive by the weekend. So what I'm gonna do is take the valves out and give them a clean with carb cleaner. Obviously when the new ones come, I will be fitting them anyway, but I'm hoping I can at least get them to work so that I can fire the engine up this weekend. All right, so these floats are basically pivoting on a pin that goes through here. I'll slide this Stanley between there. Yeah, I can push that out. And then I'll be able to grab hold of this end. So yeah, there's a little pin. So yeah, this should be slotted in like that. Yeah, so I don't know whether this bit's supposed to be spring loaded or whether it's supposed to like spring load in its seat, I'm not sure. So what I think I'm gonna do now is take out this one because this is the one that seems to be working properly and we'll have a compare. All right, so this is gonna be really hard to show on the camera, but basically that little pin there in the middle is spring loaded on this one. And this is the valve out of the one that seems to be operating correctly. But on this one, that doesn't move at all, it's solid. I think I'm just gonna take it outside, squirt it with a load of carb cleaner, and then see if I can put some pressure on it and see if it'll move. Try and tap it with these pliers. Oh, well, now it's gone in, but it won't spring back out. I'll tap the side and see if it'll spring back out. Um, huh? That nib nibbly bit gone in? Yeah, oh, there you go, it's come back out now. Yeah, that's, that's springing now. Sweet. All right, I'm going to give it a bit more carb cleaner um, and just keep plunging it. Do the same with the other three and then put it back together and hopefully the floats will spring as they're supposed to. All right, so I've got the carbs all back together now and they're all now springing as they should. Admittedly, this one is a bit slow. That one was really, really stiff. But as I say, I've got a brand new set of those valves coming from Dan ST Engineering. And at least now, even if they don't get here by the weekend, I can at least try and start the engine. So now I need to put these covers back on. I noticed that the screws that hold them on are all quite chewed up. So from Tool Station today, I bought this bag of M5 Allen key bolts. And I think that these Allen key bolts should make it easier to take these off if I ever need to while the carbs are on the engine, like if I'm on the dyno and I need to change their jets. Although using Allen key bolts, I'll definitely have to be careful not to over tighten them. They didn't have any M5 spring washers and this bolt is exactly the same length as the original one, but the original one has a spring washer on. But these holes at the bottom here, they go right through, so there's no worries about the length there. And this one, I've just tested it and it is just about short enough. But I'll probably throw some spring washers on them eventually anyway. So yeah, I'm going to throw these back together. Need to tighten the Jubilee clips on these silicone hoses here. And tomorrow, I'm going to take this fitting into a plumbing shop that I go past when I'm working. Because that takeoff is for the servo and Maud doesn't have a servo, so I'm just going to blank that off. Anyway, I'm going to continue this video at the weekend when hopefully, fingers crossed, I'll be attempting to start Maud's new ST170 engine. Hello, it's now beyond the weekend and I've come around the garage here before work. Now at the weekend, I failed to get Maud's new ST170 engine running. I've now been filming this video for about a week and a half, but before I end this video, I wanna bring you up to speed with everything that's gone on. So before we have a look in Maud's engine bay, I'm just gonna take you into her cockpit to show you a couple of things. 
as you can see, I've now swapped out her accelerator pedal for this Group 4 style one that was very kindly sent to me ages ago by a guy called Chris Dennigan. Massive shout out and a thanks to you, mate. Yeah, I really like how long this pedal is and it's also got this extra bracing. Now, the way that you'd normally use one of these pedals is you would attach a block thing to the top here. So yeah, this slides onto there and then you put a bolt through there to hold it on the pedal and then the cable or cables um, run through these holes and then you just have, they're supposed to be grub screws on the side there to trap the cable in, but I lost the grub screws, so I've got these bolts. So yeah, on this pedal, that would mean that I'd have to run the throttle cable through the top of the bulkhead, which I don't want to do. So what I've done instead is I've drilled a hole lower down on the pedal there, and then I'll be able to pass the cable through that hole and just add this solderless nipple, which will hold it in place. So I'll be drilling my hole in the bulkhead. I'm hoping that I can get it between the pedal box here and that line of spot welds, which is where the inner wing welds to the bulkhead. And I've got this thing that you attach to the bulkhead for the cable to pass through. So yeah, really happy with the new accelerator pedal. Another thing that's going on in here is I've now wired up the ME100 ECU. I'm planning to mount this to the switch panel on Velcro, but I can't find my Velcro tape. And what that will mean is if I ever park the car up and I need to add a layer of security, I can just unplug the ECU, take it off the switch panel and put it in my pocket. So with the plug and play loom, it's really easy to wire up. You've just got these red wires that need to go to a switched power. And I've already got a relay mounted to the passenger side kick panel, which was powering up my node is. So yeah, the power feed from that relay is just hooked up to these red wires. And then you've got these black wires that need to go to earth. I've just temporarily wired this up. I am gonna neaten things up, but yeah, that earth wire runs to the body here. Now, the other day I did plug my laptop into the ME100 and I've changed a few settings on the ECU. So I'll put a clip in now of what I did. All right, so I've got my laptop plugged in to the ME100 ECU using the lead that was supplied by Motorsport Electronics. And the first thing I'm gonna do is open up the software, which is the Motorsport Electronics Integrated Tuning Environment, or MITE for short. Now it's worth noting that I've already tested the ME100 on Maud's old engine. So basically I need to tell the ECU that I'm now running an ST170 instead of a normal ZTEC. It's trying to check the ports for a connection. So turn the ignition on, flip this switch up, and then this one, which is the ECU connection. You can see that it's now detected the ME100. I'll just select that and click OK. And straight away, we're connected or connecting. And now it's connected. All right, so on the start screen, which is what it opens up on anyway, I'm going to go here to the cam pattern, which is set to none at the moment, because with Maud's old setup, I didn't even have a cam sensor. So I'm going to change that from none to ST170. Now down here, the primary load is throttle position sensor. So I'm gonna leave that because the bike carbs do have a throttle position sensor, unlike Maud's old setup with a twin choke Weber. Now I have got the throttle position sensor wired up just temporarily, just twisted the wires together because I wanna make sure that I've got the wires in the right order. So if I go to sensor calibration, and here you've got a coolant temperature graph, an intake air temperature graph, none of which I'll be using with this setup. If I scroll down, over here, I've got the throttle position and it's already sitting at 94%. So I'm guessing I've got that round the wrong way. But what I'm gonna do is just cycle the throttle position sensor and see if that goes up or down. If it's the wrong way around, it will go down. If it still goes up, then it's wired right, but I need to calibrate it. Right, in fact, at the moment, I haven't got the throttle position sensor hooked up to the bike carbs and the sensor itself isn't spring loaded, so I'm unable to see which way on the sensor is zero and 100. So we'll leave that for the minute. But yeah, it works. The ECU is getting a reading off it, but I just need to figure out when it's attached to the bike carbs, whether I need to swap those two wires around. And next, I'm going to go to the mapping tab. And what I've decided to do as a bit of a base map is I'm going to copy the ignition map from the map that's on Esther, my Mark 1 Escort. I'm gonna do the same for the VVT map. Obviously, there's no fuel map with this setup because it's running carbs. So now we're on the mapping screen. We've got the ignition table over here, which is kind of off the screen at the moment. Um, 
Right, we'll scroll across to the right, that's better. Right, so this is the ignition map that I copied from the Nodis. That setup didn't have a TPS, that's why you know the, the values are the same all the way down because it basically ignores TPS and just relies on the engine speed to determine what ignition to run. Now, if you go up to here where it says menu, you can actually import the map from a different calibration. So import from calibration. And then in my computer, I've got all the maps that were done by Chris Todd on the rolling road. And I'm just gonna go to the latest one. These three here are for Esther's latest engine. I'm just gonna go to the latest one, click that, and then open. And then it's loaded the ignition map from Esther's map into here. And everything else in the ECU has been left as it was. And then you need to just click save. So now I'm gonna go up to VVT up here and basically do the same thing. Menu, import from calibration, and then over to the maps that are in my computer, SRR17, and open. And there we have Esther's VVT map now loaded into the ME100. So hopefully those settings will be okay as a bit of a base map. I probably won't be driving the car much if at all, until I've actually had it properly rolling roaded on the dyno with Chris Todd though. There is one other thing that I might have to change and I'm not gonna know that until I try and start the engine. If we go back to the start tab, I've got the trigger offset here, which is set to 75. And basically with a ZTEC or an ST170, that needs to be set to 75 or 255, but I'm not gonna know which one is correct until I try and start the engine. If I try and start the engine and it sounds like it almost wants to start, but there's loads of popping and banging out of the exhaust, then I know to change that to 255 and hopefully it'll be sweet. But yeah, those settings that are in the ME100 now should hopefully, fingers crossed, get the engine started. I think what I'm gonna do now is save calibration, and we'll just call that ME100, mod, base. Let's put base one. There you go. So yeah, hopefully those settings will allow mods ST170 to start when the time comes. All right, so into Maud's engine bay, and I've got the plug and play loom coming through this hole in the bulkhead, and I've got all the sensors plugged in. I've got the crank sensor plugged in down there. I've got the cam sensor here, the VVT solenoid here, and underneath the inlet manifold, I've now got the coil pack mounted, and that's plugged in as well. Annoyingly, I had to lengthen the wires for the coil pack, but this time I actually made up a brand new connector with some leads and then yeah, just soldered those leads into the loom. Yeah, as you can see down there, there's plenty of slack now on that bit of the loom. I've also wired up the throttle position sensor here, um, but yeah, I haven't done that permanently yet because I need to make sure I've got the wires around the right way, as I explained in the clip you just saw. Now, as you can see, the bike carbs aren't fitted to the inlet manifold. They're actually at home, and later on in this video, I'll explain all the grief I've been having with those. One thing I didn't mention before is I've actually got the IK Engineering light flywheel bolted to this engine, and I've used a brand new set of ARP flywheel bolts that I got from my friends at Burton Power. Now, to use that flywheel, I have had to space the crank sensor away slightly. I've just used some copper washers, and if you don't do that, it basically rubs on the back of the flywheel. The IK Engineering flywheel is also designed to use a Pinto starter, rather than the LRS 707 starter that you'd use if you were using a stock ZTEC flywheel, or the Turbo Sport light flywheel, like I've got fitted to Esther. And I did actually have to shave a little bit off of the starter motor, where it was found. It's the cone bit that sort of wraps around the pinion. But yeah, that's all bolted up now, I'm working fine. I did actually think that the starter motor was faulty because I had the trigger wire on this spade terminal when it is in fact supposed to be on the one at the bottom. I wasn't gonna bother fitting this fancy rocker cover yet, but I decided to whip the rocker cover off and cover the cams in oil. So I thought I might as well put this cover back on. I have removed the spark plugs and I've already tried to turn the engine over to check for oil pressure. Now, for some reason, I was only getting about 12 PSI of oil pressure, but the fact that I'm getting some oil pressure means that I am happy to attempt to start this engine. And I'll leave my mechanics oil pressure gauge hooked up so that when I do start the engine, I can 
see straight away if the oil pressure does rise. And if it doesn't, I'll shut the engine off straight away. Going back to the wiring loom for a sec, this is actually an ME221 wiring loom, which means there's some extra connectors on there that I don't need to use. Things like the injector wires, the air and coolant temperature sensor wires, and the map sensor wires as well. And rather than cutting those connectors off, I've basically tied them to the loom with some cable ties and they're just tucked behind the engine there, sitting on top of the bell housing. And what that means is that if I ever do go injection with this car, I can send the ME100 back to Motorsport Electronics and they can unlock the fuel inside of it for a small fee and I'll already have a loom. I've now got the Retro Ford alternator kit fitted to this engine. It was obviously fitted to Maud's blacktop before and this countersunk bolt here that holds the idler pulley bracket to the water pump was over tightened by some idiot. That would be me. So I actually ended up having to drill that bolt off to get that bracket off of Maud's old engine. But I've got myself a bag of M6 by 20 countersunk bolts from Tool Station so that I was able to bolt that bracket towards new engine. So I think that's everything worth mentioning on the engine bay side of things. Obviously haven't yet hooked up the exhaust manifold, the radiator, the anti-roll bar still isn't hooked up and I don't want to do any of that until I've actually started the engine and checked if the clutch is working. It's worth noting though that this time, unlike when I tried to use the heavy duty bearing before, the clutch fork did have a little bit of free play before I hooked the cable up. Anyway, I'm going to continue this video this evening when I get home and I'll explain everything that's been going on with Maud's bike carbs. Hello, right, so before I end this video, I wanna explain everything that has gone on with Maud's bike carbs, which are again here at home on the dinner table. Now, when I had the bike carbs mounted to the inlet manifold on Maud's ST170 engine, the first thing I wanted to do was check the fuel pressure because I've heard that bike carbs can be sensitive to too much fuel pressure. So I screwed my fuel gauge into my Malpassi fuel regulator that's already mounted to the car and plumbed the carbs in and flicked on the fuel pump. And by the time I'd got round to the engine bay, the carbs were leaking fuel. Where they were leaking from was one of these T pieces here, which is where the fuel inlet is um, yeah so there's a t-piece behind there that thing there and yeah fuel was leaking from there and it was also coming out of here which is supposed to be a breather so i immediately thought that the fuel pressure was too high even though it was only showing about two and a half psi so i turned it down on the fuel pressure regulator as far as it'd go without the little adjuster screw falling out and it was still leaking. Wasn't as bad, but it was still leaking. So I then decided to bring the carbs home here and take them apart and investigate. It's worth noting that to take these carbs apart, you've got a rod here and another one here. And basically that rod goes all the way through all four carburetors and you've got a nut either end. And yeah, once you undo the nuts and take those rods out, the carbs do come apart. Although when I first took those rods out, the carbs didn't seem like they wanted to come apart and I didn't want to force them. So I started investigating to see if there was anything else that's holding them together. Now at first, I thought that the shafts that hold the throttle flaps in there, basically I thought it was just one shaft going through all four of them. Let's get some light so you can see. So I actually started trying to remove the throttle flaps and a couple of the screws got chewed up. Now luckily, before I actually started drilling those screws out, I realized that each carb actually has its own shaft for the throttle flaps. So I started investigating elsewhere to see if there's any bolts or screws that were holding the carbs together. So I had another look inside the fuel bowls and there was nothing there. And then I decided to take one of these caps off and a couple of these screws got chewed up. I've actually replaced this one for another one that I had in my garage. I have actually ordered a full set of screws for these carbs. So when they come, I'm definitely gonna change these three because um, yeah, these, these other two are chewed up and this one is obviously odd. But yeah, inside that cap, there's just a diaphragm. There was nothing you know that was holding the carbs together. So then I decided to just give the carbs a bit more of a wiggle and they did come apart. So it is literally just these two rods that hold all the carbs together. It's worth noting though that this plate thing here that slides, that's the choke mechanism. I did remove that and that's just removed by taking 
these two screws out. So yeah, once the carbs come apart, I basically took this end one off and this end one off, and then these T pieces basically came out. And then I could see that those T pieces had O-rings on them. So I decided to go back around the garage the next day and I replaced those O-rings with some generic ones that I had in my garage. And then once the carbs were back together, there was then no fuel coming from those T-pieces, but it still was coming out of this breather. Now, because I knew that I'd had an issue with the float valves before, I immediately assumed that maybe it was down to them, because if the float valves aren't working, then when the float valves are full, the fuel doesn't stop entering the carb and it can flood them. So I gave the float valves another clean out. This time I used a screw to push the plunger beyond flush and I gave them a spray with carb cleaner and yeah, they operate better than they ever did. In fact, the one that was stiff after I cleaned them last time is also now, you know, springing nice and freely. But with the carbs back together, I was still getting fuel coming out of this breather. It's worth noting that I did at one point, while I had, you know, this carb off, I poured fuel into where this T-piece goes into. So I had the carb on its side and I poured fuel in there. And then I was able to hold the float up, you know, with this bowl off. And with the float held up, it did actually stop the fuel coming in. And then when you let go of the float, it did actually drain out, which told me that the float valve was working enough to at least stop the fuel when it's only being pressured by gravity. Anyway, so I decided to order a brand new set of float valves, which haven't arrived yet. I did mention earlier in the video that I ordered some of those float valves from Dan ST Engineering, but when they came, they were actually too small for my carbs. And that means that I've got the later CBR 900 carbs and the Dan ST Engineering ones only fit the earlier carbs. And it does say that on his website, but obviously I didn't know which carbs I had. I've also ordered a full set of O-rings for these carbs. So you've got the two on this T-piece, the two on this T-piece, and there's also T-pieces there and there for the breather. So when they come, I'm gonna replace all those O-rings. Now, while I was ordering those float valves and the O-rings, I started thinking again about fuel pressure. And after looking online, I found that a lot of people seem to have good results with their bike carbs when they actually use a motorbike fuel pump. So I've ordered one of those off eBay as well, just a cheap 19 pound one. And I'm pretty confident that either the brand new float valves or the motorbike fuel pump will solve the issue. And what I'll probably do is fit the new valves and then plumb the carbs back into the car and see if it leaks. And then if it does, then I'll wire up and plumb in the motorbike fuel pump. And then hopefully we'll actually be able to get Esther's new ST170 engine running. Now I expect this video has been very long, so I'm gonna save that for another video. In the next video, I might actually be turning my attention to Esther, my Mark 1 Escort, and showing you guys the new project, which loads of you have been in touch to ask to see. But yeah, at some point in the near future, I will let you know how I get on with these carbs once I've fitted all those new parts. So for now, I'm gonna end this video here. If you did think it was any good, please do give it a thumbs up and a share. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Click subscribe to keep up to date with all my future uploads and check the links in the description to my social media and my website. I'll also leave my email address down there for anyone who wants to contact me. Massive thanks as always for your continued support on my channel. But other than that, until next time, thanks for watching.